Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to CE Elevated, a CSU Vet CE webinar series. I'm your host, Dr. Ross Palmer from Colorado State University. And on behalf of CSU Vet CE here at the Translational Medicine Institute, I'd like to thank you for joining us. We've named this webinar series CE Elevated. That's symbolic of our Colorado mountainous terrain, but it's also uh, symbolic of our goal to provide you with an elevated CE experience in all that we do. Uh, we believe there's a tremendous amount of power in the collision between inspired learners, that's you guys, engaged educators, that's our guest this evening, and meaningful experiences. Tonight, we're sincerely thankful for the support of Muvora, who has made this webinar episode possible. Tonight, we're joined by a orthopedic colleague, surgeon, friend of mine, uh, Dr. Ken Brucker. Dr. Brucker is a board certified surgeon and also a board certified in the veterinary sports medicine and rehabilitation. He's got special interests in orthopedics and joint surgery. He's authored over 100 textbook chapters, journal articles, scientific manuscripts, and other educational materials. And he's been an innovator in the development of new surgical techniques and orthopedic implants and has been performing arthroscopic surgery for over 25 years. Um, he is the founder of the Veterinary Medical and Surgical Group, VMSG, as well as the Continuing Orthopedic Veterinary Education, uh, that's COVE, and has been invited to train veterinarians throughout the world. His commitment to education of veterinarians, technicians, pet owners, and, pet, uh, and the pet owners has earned him California VMA's Veterinarian of the Year, as well as Hands-On Educator of the Year for the 2022 Western Veterinary Conference. So tonight, I truly am very honored to welcome my friend and colleague, Dr. Ken Brucker. And so, Ken, welcome to this evening's webinar, and feel free to take it away. Thank you, Ross. I uh, appreciate the introduction, and I'm going to see if I can get this ball rolling, sharing screen. Again, I just want to say thank you for everybody to join in with us. Um, those of you that have been in uh, live courses with me know that I like to have a very interactive session, which quite honestly is a little bit difficult to do in a webinar setting. Um, but with Ross and Jeff's help, we've uh, tried to at least create some some areas where you guys can give feedback um, to some of the questions I'm going to pose. Um, I have no disclosures to make relevant to this presentation. And um, like Ross said, uh, there is uh, no compensation, so I'm not beholden to anybody. Um, all right, first, first uh, slide. Um, this is gonna be a poll question. So hopefully your poll um, window will pop up. And I just want you to just give me a region on where is the problem? Is it, is it in the area that's designated A, area designated B, um, C, or D? And just type in, type in just region. All right, before we talk about the answer on that one, this is one where I'm gonna have you type in just some uh, free form answers in your chat window and, and Ross will help me monitor that. And the question is, what is this? So I'm seeing a response of a light bulb. Anybody else want to take a kick at it? All right. Oh, well, that's good. Um, it's probably unfair because Rodrigo knows I've seen this before, but um, it is a light bulb. So the point of that is that it's hard to tell what you're looking at with just one view. And I think that's the, the benefit to uh, when we're doing radiography is to always think about orthogonal, orthogonal views. So getting back to this question, what, what region was this? We didn't have enough information from the lateral view alone. You can see once we do a cranial caudal radiograph, we can see that this uh, patient actually has a medial femoral condylar fracture that is not really evident on that lateral um, that lateral image. Now, um, here's another question, and, and this is a rhetorical question. There's no response required, but when you think about trying to size an implant for a patient, um, 
you, you can look at this image and you can say, well, what size plate should I use? And the reality is we, again, don't have enough information. We have orthogonal views. We can make a diagnosis of a fracture, but we really don't have any idea how big this patient actually is. So for that, we need some way of calibrating the radiograph. And this is one of the, this is one way to do it. Um, and the way I prefer is to use a calibration ball. These are balls that are of known diameter. My ball, is, the one you see here is one inch in diameter or 2.54 centimeters. And the advantage to having a ball over a flat ruler is, is that the ball is going to hold that dimension no matter what angle it's at. Whereas say a right left marker could be not flat or not perpendicular to the x-ray beam, in which case then you're gonna be seeing it at an angle and that'll give you a false sense of actual measurement. So the basic principles when we're looking at radiographs, um, particularly when we're looking with fractures, is to use some form of sedation for us for satisfactory positioning. Um, center the beam on the area of interest, of course, and then two views, orthogonal views. Classically, that's going to be a lateral and a cranial caudal, but there may be indications where you choose two other views. It's important to collimate the image, mostly to do decrease scatter. And with digital radiography now, uh, just getting an accurate measurement and talk about which area of interest that you're on will usually set your MAS and KVP appropriately. I am a big, big fan of imaging both legs, whether it's a fracture, whether it's a cruciate, whatever, whether it's patellar luxation, elbow dysplasia, I will always try to image the contralateral limb for comparison because there will be things that you may pick up that look like an abnormality on your lame leg that is identical on the other leg and that might be just an anatomic variation for that patient. So it doesn't take much extra time. I hear lots of places where they say, well, it costs too much to do that. And I figure by the time that we have added in surgery, anesthesia, pain medica medication on a patient, the extra cost for two views is probably um, insignificant. So that's my preference um, to image both limbs. And then again, calibrating. So I think everybody's familiar with uh, how to take or position patients for taking orthopedic radiographs. But I found that there's um, two things that I will do slightly different, uh, or in addition to perhaps traditional orthogonal radiographic acquisition. And one of those is on the humerus, I like to place patients on their back um, and pull the uh, limb of interest distally, or I'm sorry, caudally, um, because that can get you a really true cranial caudal projection of the humerus, and in particular, the distal humerus when we're looking at condylar fractures. So you can see in the images here um, how that can center right on the beam, and you can get a really nice uh, radiograph where if they're laying on their chest and you have their limb pulled forward, sometimes the angulation won't give you a true perspective on size um, or allow you to see um, the detail of that. Recognize it, of course, that you're not going to have a very good image of the antebrachium. Very similarly with the femur, as I'll lay them on their back and pull their limb of interest cranially so that we're shooting, again, a very, very true caudal cranial radiograph of just the femur. Um, it's not useful, uh, particularly useful for the hip, and it's not useful at all for the, for the tibia but, um, or stifle, but for an actual femur and femur fractures in particular, um, it can be a very useful um, position. So basic principles, all radiographs need to have clinic name, patient name, client name, date, um, and then there may be other important information depending on uh, if you're submitting radiographs for outside um, reads like pen hip or OFA. Um, you need to have right or left markers. Traditionally, we would put the marker on the lateral side of a limb. 
Um, and then a size reference marker. And like I said, uh, I like to use a calibration ball as opposed to a linear measurement. Traditionally, when we're viewing radiographs, um, we will try to position them so that patient is on the cranial caudal, it's as if we are looking at them from the front. Whether we acquired them in a different way or not, we'll change that position before we send it to the PACs. And then um, by tradition, all limbs are going as if the patient is running from right to left. So here's another one for your chat um, option, and that is describe this fracture. And I'm not looking for everyone to write every single description, but just throw out a key word or two um, that would help to describe this fracture. I'm not seeing any brave souls. Oh, there, there we, we go. go. Yep. Severely, well, I won't say. Uh, yeah, severely comminuted mid diaphyseal right humeral fracture mid shaft multiple fracture, comminuted, comminuted fracture of distal diaphyseal humerus. So those are a few of the descriptors. Perfect. So um, some very key points there. One was that uh, a, a, we're dealing with a right humerus. So um, second was it's a comminuted fracture. Uh, third is location or region, and it's um, mid diaphyseal to distal um, diaphyseal. Uh, from this view, it does not appear to be articular. Um, and we may be able to even make a comment that it, it could be closed. We don't see a lot of gas or anything around it that might be an indication of open. And one other thing that when we're talking particularly about comminuted fractures is to look at it and say, is this reconstructible with good biomechanical effect? That is, can we put all of this back together and accomplish uh, what we call load sharing where those reduced fragments are actually contributing some, to some of the stability? Sorry about that, a little glitch. So um, those are all good points. When we start talking about surgical planning, um, we there's a number of different um, options available. And this is one that um, I have come to use. It's called VPOP Pro. Um, it's available to everybody as a free trial, I think for 30 days, uh, they probably put probably have to put your, your um, credit card in or something, but you get it refunded if you don't want to keep the program. It's a subscription service, um, but it allows us to do um, pretty, pretty extensive surgical planning for orthopedics. Um, as a disclaimer, again, I do not receive any compensation from VPOP and I pay for its use like everyone else. So I feel pretty comfortable and be able to promote it. There's other programs out there as well. Um, most are not that well supported in veterinary medicine. And this one is created by a veterinary surgeon um, in England. So um, what is VPOP? Well, VPOP is a program where we can bring the image from our packs and import it into this, this uh, application or software that allows us to um, do some planning on the fracture. So this is that same that same individual. It's actually it's a it's the Bobcat I named Bob, um, but um, you can see that Bob has a, again a highly comminuted mid shaft right humeral fracture. Uh, we have his left humerus in the same image, um, a nice cranial caudal view. I'm not going to go into how we import the program or actually use the program. Um, in this particular uh, setting, but we will talk about that in the courses uh, during the course of the, the live courses this year. So anyway, this is an image I've imported. The next thing I need to do is calibrate the image. So um, there's a calibration tool so that the um, software knows what size we're dealing with. So again, I know my ball is 2.54 centimeters. So I've told the program. Um, what size um, that ball is, and now the image is calibrated. And then once I have a calibrated image, there's a tool that allows us to bring implant uh, templates in from just about any manufacturer in the world. 
they can be plates, they can be interlocking nails, it can be a lot of things. So now you can bring a plate in, an image of a plate and you can lay it up again. I'm using the normal leg as as my as my uh, template leg because the fractured leg it's too hard to tell um, length. It's too hard to get it positioned properly. So my contralateral limb becomes my limb of reference. So I can see what size plate I want to use, what length plate I want to use, and um, I can even get um, some linear measurements of what a screw length would be. So in this case here a screw in the top plate position would measure about 18 millimeters. So I know when I'm in surgery, if I'm measuring 32 millimeters for that screw, something's wrong. Or if I'm measuring 12, something's wrong. Um, I should be able to have this as a backup reference for what that screw length really should be. And I don't necessarily measure every every single screw hole, but I'll take a couple of uh, representative measurements for that. Second thing is, is that you can template with other, with other implants as well. So you can see here, we looked at what if we put an interlocking nail in and what size nail would we use um, for that? And again, also being able to get the measurements for the, um, the length of the uh, bolts um, when we cut them. So it's always good to have a plan B or even a plan C when you're going into a uh, fracture repair. All right, um, that's gonna be our, our first little break. And I just wanted to give a few minutes to have some questions if you have them and uh, Ross will help me with that if there are any. And you can answer questions, you can ask questions anytime during the presentation because Ross is going to kind yeah, of help supervise those. If you have any questions, anybody, you can type those into your Q&A window, which is down there near your chat window you've been using. So if there are any questions, great. And uh, I don't see any there just yet, but do feel free to type them in. And maybe when we do our next pause, if there's any questions, we'll pick them up at that time. Can, can do that. All right, so I'm gonna uh, we're gonna spend the the, the rest of tonight's session uh, with a case based sort of evaluation. This is a, a psycho. Um, she is a ten and a half year old domestic short hair um, torty shell, so probably hence the word psycho. Um, and she has a his, she has an indoor outdoor lifestyle, uh, weighs approximately five kilograms uh, with a history of left hind limb. Lameness of three days duration. And um, when we start talking about what kinds of things we're going to do for stabilization of our fractures, there's a number of different things that we need to consider. Not only what's the fracture look like and how we're gonna fix it, but there's some other things as well, um, particularly with biology. Um, and that's gonna be what's the level of tissue trauma with a particular patient, um, how long we think surgery might take, how much trauma we might induce as surgeons, uh, what surgical approach we're going to use, age and health of the patient. This one's not, uh, not too old, not too young. Those are all factors. So for example, if this was a very young patient um, with a very simple fracture, that might be something that any surgeon would say, you know what, I feel pretty comfortable tackling that. Whereas if it's a very, very comminuted fracture in an older debilitated patient, you know, maybe that's one where you would say, you know, that's, that's not probably in my wheelhouse and let's see if we can get you on to somebody else who has a little more experience with that or wants to tackle it, or maybe even just has the right implant, like an interlocking nail. Um, mechanical factors we'll talk a little bit about. Again, I mentioned load sharing and whether the bone itself will contribute to stability once reduced. Uh, patient size, I saw today uh, a uh, 80 kilogram um, Siberian Husky. So I can tell you not a thin little patient. Um, and the patient was also 11 years old with some other disabilities. So those become some mechanical factors that we need to consider um, that might contribute to success or not success. And then uh, clinical factors like uh, patient disposition, you know, the word psycho kind of gives you a little bit of an idea that maybe this is not gonna be a really easy patient to handle. Um, whereas as well as post care and uh, you know what sometimes it comes down to client client uh, consideration I had a veterinarian send me radiographs the other day that said you know here's a dog that or, or yeah a little dog that had a revision surgery and 
um, radius ulna and, and uh, you know, we're considering pulling the plate, what do you think? And we started seeing some, of, some evidence of resorption. And I said, well, if it's, a, if it's a really cooperative owner and they can still continue to confine this, this dog for you know, a couple of weeks, I feel comfortable having that plate removed. And they said, it's not a cooperative owner. The dog runs free. They will not create it. And that may change you know, how you approach a case, whether it's uh, time of implant removal or even how you're going to maybe stabilize a fracture. Um, and so those are all things to consider. All right. so. Um, here's your next question. Um, and this is just going to be also into the chat window. Is this fracture anatomically reconstructable with biomechanical effect? Meaning, can we put this back together piece by piece and have some load sharing uh, contribute to the overall stability? Uh, so, and there's also some questions coming in, but we'll get those at the next Q&A. With regard to this, uh, is it anatomically reconstructable? I have a yes. I have some no's. Uh, I would say no's predominate, but there's a few who answered yes. Okay, great. My answer would be no. And part of it is there's probably portions of this fracture that are reconstructable and could con contribute to... Um, to overall stability and load sharing. But we do have quite a few small little pieces that are not gonna be able to be put back into place. So when we think about fracture repair, we can kind of break it into those two sort of philosophical categories. And that is um, anatomic reconstruction or uh, we call direct healing. And that's where we can literally put every piece back together. Um, and, and, and appreciate direct healing, which is what we would expect when we're doing an osteotomy and, and we're gonna have direct bone-to-bone -bone contact with good stability. Versus the other philosophical way to look at something is, is to go with more of a biologic fixation where we're not going to try to put all those pieces back together. Uh, we're gonna focus on good alignment and stability, but not worry if those pieces all come back together. And that's what we talk about with um, when we're looking at indirect healing. And one way to think about that is indirect healing is exactly what we accomplish when we're doing external coaptation. So a cast or a splint or something like that, or um, back when I was and Ross were residents, it would have been an external fix it or would have been probably our, our single and only choice um, back then. So again, it comes down to some of these factors again on what we're going to do to approach this, um, this fracture repair. So is this a castable fracture? That is, can we treat this with external coaptation alone? You don't have to answer this. I'll answer that for you. This is not a castable fracture. Uh, number one, it's a femur, which makes it uh, very difficult to immobilize the joint above and the joint below. Um, and that's gonna be kind of our primary, our primary reason for that and, and um, what we would look at if we were talking about a castable fracture. So what surgic, which of these five surgical choices are, is contraindicated for this fracture? And this is a poll question. So if you can type in your answer, uh, this is a poll question. All right, probably have most of our questions in, uh, answers in, so. Um, so a few choices, um, uh, I would say it looks like I am pin and cerclage has the majority of the answers and I, I would concur with that. Um, when we look at the biomechanical forces acting on a joint, um, these are the, um, sorry, I got to close my poll window. These are the primary forces that we're looking at. Um, that is bending forces, torsional forces, as well as compression or axial, axial forces that result in compression or collapse. So when we think about um, what kind of implant we're going to use, we need to be thinking about what forces are acting on that fracture and what forces the implant is gonna be best at counteracting. So which one is contraindicated? Um, it's, it's IM pin and cerclage wire. 
because IM pin and surclage is only applicable in fractures that can be anatomically reconstructed. That's the principle of surclage wire is to be able to pull all those pieces back together and stabilize them um, with the IM pin. So I would put that as our single choice for contraindication. And I would tell you that I've used number two, number three, number four, and number five as options in these kinds of fractures in the past. So this is kind of a surgical preference question, also a poll, um, poll every or poll question. Which stabilization technique would you prefer for this? And it may have to do with what you're experienced with. It may have to do with what biomechanically you know is going to be the best choice. Um, and it could be what you have available in your practice. Um, these are the things that that um, um, how sometimes lead to uh, how we choose to repair something. So uh, external fixture with an IM pin, pin, certainly I've done those. Bone plate alone, yep, plate rod, interlocking nail, good choices, all good choices and for, for various reasons. For me now, these days, I probably would um, primarily pick um, plate rod or interlocking nail. But what's important is trying to understand how a various uh, or, or a specific implant is going to accomplish what we need to accomplish. So if we look at an IM pin alone, it is really strong where? Well, it's really strong in um, bending, but not very good with axial compression if we have a comminuted fracture. In the case of the image on the, the image on the left where we have a simple transverse fracture. Now we have load sharing, which makes an IM pin um, functional for axial compression. And then the other force that we deal with in long bones again is torsion and an IM pin alone is not gonna be very effective with torsion. So IM pin strength is gonna be with bending. Tension and shear are, are forces that are more applicable to juxta articular or articular fractures. So we won't talk about those. So that's kind of the, the principle of surclage and uh, IM pin is having a reconstructable fracture. And that's where the surclage wire comes in is if it helps us to stabilize some obliquity. Plate and screws. What's a plate and screws strength? Well, plate and screws are good with bending in particular bending um, in the direction where the plate is wider than it is narrow. Um, good with axial compression, again, because of the nature of how a plate can, can work and very good with torsion as well. So plates alone for uh, say a comminuted fracture like this uh, could be a very, very satisfactory alternative. What about plate rod? But with plate rod, we kind of get the benefit of both worlds. And so we get a lot better stability with bending because now we have that IM pin that's gonna to help to protect bending in all directions. The plate's gonna provide some axial compression protection as well as torsion. So a plate rod is gonna be much more stable than a plate alone. And um, interlocking nail, is actually really good for just about all of the forces that we deal with, bending, axial compression, and torsion, because we have the benefit of, again, an intramedullary device uh, for the bending, as well as having some uh, sort of screw or bolt that locks into that interlocking nail uh, for the torsion and axial compression stability. And then external fixators can have variable effects depending on the construct that we do. And, um, and, but again, really, really good with um, all of these directions, bending, axial compression and torsion. It's just hard to get a traditional uh, IM pin or not really possible to get a traditional, uh, I mean, external fixator onto uh, a femur uh, without some sort of a intramedullary tie-in. Okay, um, that completes the second part of this presentation and I want to see if we have any questions and I think yeah, I did there might be some. none submitted in the Q&A window but I'm going to go back through the chat and um, there are a couple there um, da, da, da. 
I'm going to do a fracture at a shelter with no calibration tool. Any other tools I can use to calibrate my radiographs? Yes, that's an excellent question. Uh, you can use a, a quarter. Um, so just a, a traditional p coin of any known dimension. If you measure a quarter, a quarter measures about one inch, but you could use a nickel, you could use a dime, just, just measure what that is and calibrate it and just make sure it's at the level of the fracture so you have no um, magnification error. And I think that can work really well for you. Yep, I'll chime in on that. I think uh, sometimes you can build up uh, a little pillar with Play-Doh and then plop your quarter on top of there. Make sure you get your quarter nice and flat. Um, another one is how to know if we need a plate or pin or circlage. And I will say that question came in before you went through that description. So um, that may be um, a little bit water under the bridge. Yeah, Ho hopefully that hopefully I answered that question in that last session. If I didn't, then let's bring it up again and we'll talk about it. Um, what, one thing I'll I'll add on that is, and it's just a simple rule. I know a lot of people have access to uh, to pin and wire, and they they want to use that, right? Um, if you see lots of cortical pieces and you see small pieces. Uh, end of story, put down the pin and wire and nobody gets hurt. Um, so, so lots of pieces and little pieces, your pin and wire isn't going to help you there. It's only going to hurt you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't see anything else. Okay. Let's uh, carry on and we'll have time at the end. All right. So um, I already mentioned to you my preference uh, for this particular patient probably would be plate rod and interlocking nail. Um, and on this particular patient, oh, this is my question and it's blocking my view a little bit, um, plate rod. So this is another poll question. Um, number one, would you use, uh, if you're doing a plate rod, what size pin would you select? And those of you that are familiar with, um, and have some experience with, um, intramedullary pin and cerclage know that for most of the long bones that we deal with, we're looking for a fairly large pin size. Like we wanna take up a good portion of the di the medullary cavity. So, you know, traditionally on a femur, I would pick a 75% of the, of the femur size and we end up downsizing a little bit on the tibia just because of its um, sigmoid shape. But when we're combining it with a, a rod, um, then, um, then we have other considerations as well. So it looks like we've got uh, quite a few choices for um, 30, choice number two, choice number three, choice number four, nobody choosing number five. That's very good. And let me do a little repositioning on my screen. Got a lot of things open here. And I'm gonna close that. And the answer is uh, 30 to 50% of the bone. So when we're doing a plate rod, we downsize the pin or the rod um, to literally about half of what we thought we would have used um, it, with a IM pin and cerclage wire. And um, there's been quite a bit of stuff to look at that biomechanically. Um, and, and Don Hulse was sort of the, the pioneer in having us look at plate rod. Uh, stability for patients. So just think roughly about half of what you would do if you were going to do IM pin and cerclage in, uh, as your choice. Here's another poll question uh, that is uh, what size plate and screws would you select? Like you would want to like you don't you want to find a plate that's going to fit this patient. So you're going to pick a plate with a screw diameter that is about what percent of the diameter of the bone. So diameter of the screw relative to the diameter of the bone. We've got a few, few votes for 25%, a few votes for 70%. Vote for 40%. And so Ken here, are you talking about the diameter of the screw relative yes. to the bone? Okay. Diameter of the screw the threads of the screw relative to the bone. Okay, it looks like we've got quite a, like, got our 50% our um, participants uh, voted in, a majority 
like a 25 percent. So I'll close that, get that out of the way. Yeah, so um, the uh, answer is no bigger than 40%. So traditionally, I'm usually in the 30 to 35% range when I'm looking at screw diameter and plate size. Um, and the reference for that is the AO principles uh, textbook. Um, and a typical cat femur is going to be a 2.4 millimeter plate and screws. Um, I'm fine going down to 25%, particularly if I if I maybe upsize my intramedullary pin a little bit, but if I'm going with kind of a traditional, um, you know, 40% of the diameter of the bone for my um, IM pin, I'm gonna go stay, try to stay in the 30, 35% range for diameter of my screw. Okay. Um, which of these, this is another poll question, which of these assessments is not made on an immediate post-operative radiographic evaluation? The answer is activity. Yeah, so when we're looking at an immediate post-operative radiograph, um, or when we look at any post-operative uh, orthopedic image, um, you know, we, we talk about the four A's, and these are the four A's, alignment, apposition, apparatus, and activity. And essentially, alignment has to do with um, both um, angular as well as torsional alignment. That is, how, how well um, is the bone positioned above relative to the position of below. So with angular alignment, we talk about both frontal plane and sagittal plane. That is, did we introduce varus? Did we introduce valgus? Or uh, procruvatum or recruvatum? Torsional alignment can be a little harder to evaluate radiographically, but that's where we're looking at how the bones are lined up in that, in that axial plane. So whether there's a twist in the, in the bone for our repair. And on the femur, um, again, we can look at, you know, whether we have good um, angular alignment just pretty easily on ortho orthogonal radiographs. But torsion can be a little bit more difficult. And one of the little tips that you can do is on the femur, if you look at the lateral image, and if you can superimpose the two condyles, which this image, they're not superimposed, but they are in alignment in the uh, axial direction that is proximal to distal. If we were to uh, look at the head of the femur, and draw a line along the cranial aspect of the femur, approximately, roughly about 40 to 60 percent of the femoral head should be ahead of that line. And then we know we have not introduced a large torsional defect. So that's just another little radiographic tip without having access to axial imaging like with a CT scan. Okay, what about apposition? And by apposition, I mean reduction. Like how, how well do we get the pieces back together? Well, in a case like this, again, we already had determined that this is not a fracture that's going to be reconstructable with good biomechanical effect. So our goal wasn't necessarily to get every single piece back together. However, you can see that we made some effort to get some of those pieces back together, or at least uh, protect from maybe some concurrent fissure fractures. So this is a rhetorical question. There's no reason for you to really answer, but I want you to think about, you know, what are those, uh, what is the function of those cerclage wires distally? What was done well on this fracture repair and what maybe would you have done differently? Um, and I can, so cerclage wires, again, like we talked about, are important when we're trying to get anatomic reconstruction of large pieces of bone back together or when we're trying to protect a fissure. So it's that old barrel stave principle where we have something that's wrapping around the bone um, and actually providing our reduction. So in one, in one way, we did do some reconstruction distal um, in the distal segment, primarily to protect against a fissure fracture. 
Um, and I'd say that overall, what was done well is I think we have good implant position. We have not introduced any kind of varus or valgus. So our apposition was good, reduction was good, and the apparatus seemed to be appropriately placed. Um, what would I do differently? Nowadays, I wouldn't have made such an open incision. You can see all the little staples there. I would have taken a more minimally invasive approach, maybe open, but do not touch. Uh, I would have used fewer screws in the proximal segment. I would have used fewer screws in the distal segment and tried to just bridge that whole center area and let good old mother nature and hematoma um, do our biologic fixation for us. So stabilizing proximally and stabilizing differently. So as, as my experience in this profession has developed, um, I've become more and more minimally invasive. All right, our 12 week post-op assessment. Uh, this is where we can add that other category of activity and um, which is basically healing. And so we can start to say, well, does dog or cat have appropriate callus uh, formation? Does, um, is everything still in place? So we look at the alignment, nothing's, nothing's changed, nothing's failed, apposition. So everything's still, again, the pieces are where we put them. Apparatus is intact. We don't see any evidence of screw loosening, pin backing out, uh, screw breakage. And now we can also look at activity and, and determine, yeah, I can see callus. It looks like we've got bone activity. We are progressing on towards healing. Um, and so all those things are, are really good. Um, I'm gonna add a fifth A. Um, so we talk about the four A's, but um, uh, Mark Roche has also brought up this idea of the fifth A and the fifth A is, um, is acquisition and that is radiograph positioning. So if you look at the image on the left, that's where we have a hip extended radiograph. If you look at the pelvis relative to the femur, and again, probably the best we're gonna be able to do is get the femur about 30 degrees off of completely perpendicular to our X-ray beam in that position. Whereas the image on the right is that image I was telling you about where you can lay them on their back pull their uh, limb forward, and we're just shooting a straight cranial caudal radiograph of the femur. So when we start looking, particularly with um, activity and alignment um, in our apparatus, it's really important that you're getting the same radiographic view on every subsequent radiograph that you take and every subsequent image that you take. So I like that. I, I like that fifth A for um, looking at those patients um, down the road. So again, key points is biologic factors, mechanical factors, and clinical factors that are all going to help you to decide what's the implant of choice for a given fracture. And that takes just some you know, basic understanding of the forces that are acting on a fracture as well as what the implants can actually uh, be expected to achieve. Um, so, with uh, as we conclude this webinar, um, just would like to open it up more to questions and comments. And I appreciate all of you that have been able to be on. I recognize a lot of names of some friends there, so uh, glad to have you guys with us. So there is a question here. Um, it says it is not really a low strain fracture like a highly comminuted one. What do you think regarding the working length of the plate as short as possible? Hey, Antonio, how are you? Um, what do I think about the working length of this particular plate or in general? So when we're talking about low strain fractures, like highly comminuted ones, we really are trying to get um, as long a plate as possible. So we really want to try to keep that area um, uh, bridged pretty adequately. So it, it, we're perhaps in, in uh, the days of reconstruction, primary anatomic reconstruction, like in a radius ulna fracture, we're gonna be doing something where we do have some load sharing and uh, we'll, we'll typically we'll use a little bit shorter implant. But for these highly comminuted fractures, we are 
we are really looking at trying to get a very long end plan. Yeah, I think that's a, a really great question, Antonio. Um, uh, is you know this you know Ken you alluded to it this discussion in a, in the shift of the way that we approach fractures today versus what we might have done even just a decade ago um, and so one of the things on that case is there was that butterfly segment distally and you reconstructed that but you were still left with a non reconstructable relatively transverse fracture that you couldn't compress, you were left with a non-load sharing situation. And, and Antonio, you're clearly aware of this. That creates a very high strain environment. Whereas Ken, what you said is, is one of the things you might do differently today is not reconstruct it at all. Leave that cortical fragment out of there, open but do not touch. Keep the, that fragment viable by leaving its soft tissue attachments in place preserving the fracture hematoma, and now you actually have a much lower strain environment. So really, really uh, uh, thought-provoking sort of clinical case, one of the great things about having these clinical cases. Um, uh, Ken, would you like to comment at all about, you, you did a little bit of radiographic monitoring of that patient post-operatively, and that was a cat. Do you want to talk at all about your comparison of compare and contrast of radiographic healing, how cats might be different than dogs? That's a good question. I don't think I know the answer. About yeah. Oh, looks like another question came in. Um, but um, yeah, you know, just, just I noticed one of the things about that cat is, is whereas sometimes we'll see in dogs, you get all this proliferative callus. And it just seems to me that cats, if I were to generalize, they just tend to be a little bit less callus producers. So I don't always expect to see big proliferative callus in cats. I've seen yeah. it, but I don't necessarily have that as an expectation. And I think sometimes, you know, there's that old adage, people say, oh, you know, it's just a cat, throw a cat in the same room and a bone in the same room, watch them heal. And there really is very little evidence to suggest that. In reality, the rate of delayed unions and non-unions in cats is every bit as high, if not higher than in dogs. They tend to be a little bit slower to heal, not faster. Um, and they don't tend to be big callus producers. And those are just gross generalizations, but um, just I thought, maybe thought provoking as we we looked at that case yeah great great yep. comment Thanks. yeah well i do what can i really i want to thank you the, that was great i mean i know it's a lot of work to put these together it's a lot of work to have that interactivity but i think that was really helpful and i could tell that our audience appreciate it wait one more question came in how could we know the number of screws we will use with the plate oh that's a great question so we know from some biomechanical studies that um, when we're looking at, uh, say, just cortical screws, that uh, we're looking for a minimum of six cortices. So we look at three full bicortical screws proximal and three um, bicortical screws distally. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and with more screws, we can get more stability, although that becomes a diminishing return, more implants, not necessarily better. Um, and with locking implants, there's very, very little to be gained by having more than three um, bicortical screws, uh, proximal or distal. There's min maybe a little bit of additional stores and torsional stability, but there's not really much benefit to doing more. And when we think about screw size or we think about screw numbers, um, you know, a bigger, a bigger implant is going to be more stable, bigger screw size is going to be more stable, but that means you're taking up more of the bone, which is going to decrease the overall bone strength. So that's why we kind of try to stick with that 30, 35% diameter for our screw diameter uh, with a minimum of uh, you know, six cortices above and six cortices below. Again, great answer, great questions. And and that actually leads me to, to one of the comments I was going to make is, um, is you can only get so much in in a webinar format and and i'll talk a little bit about some of the courses we have coming up because that's a a great opportunity to be able to flesh out some of these details but before i get into that ken i really do i sincerely want to thank you for this evening 
um, a, a lot of great uh, information, and I know you put a lot of work into creating that interactivity. I really want to thank Muvora as well for sponsoring this webinar episode this evening. Um, for those of you who uh, um, are intrigued by what we've talked about this evening, or you've worked with Ken before and you're looking forward to your next opportunity, I will let you know that he is going to be leading a couple of hands-on fracture treatment courses here at CSU in September. We have a Principles of Fracture Repair, and that course will take place September 7th through 9th. And then there's an advanced fracture repair course that will follow that on September 9th through the 11th. I did take a look at those this morning. There's only a few seats that remain in each of those courses. Um, and it is also a gorgeous time to visit here in Colorado. So anyhow, if you're interested in those courses, I would not delay because those, those are going to go um, fast at this point. Um, check out those, and you can check out other courses at CSU Vet CE. I would like to thank all of you for joining us this evening. Great audience, great participation. I'll give you a heads up that next month we're going to be learning a little bit about emergency care. Um, it's going to be the ABCs of Addison's disease. Uh, and Dr. Rita Hanel from uh, the Veterinary Emergency Group will be presenting that particular episode on Wednesday, August 3rd at 7 p.m. New York time. Of course, that's 5 p.m. here in the mountains. We certainly look forward to seeing you then. And in the meantime, remember, you're more than a learner. You're a whole person. Make sure you take care of yourself and let's look out for each other. Have a great evening.